Um, Have you got a a collection of ancient documents there in front of you? Turn with me real quickly to Luke chapter 4 this morning. You like that one? (laughs) Okay, Leslie has a connect group that's running um, this, this Wednesday. So if anyone's interested, come and see Leslie about that connect group, okay? Come and see Leslie. Hand up, stand up so they can see you. There we go. So come and see Leslie Wednesday Connect Group. That works for a lot of people. So, and it's here, isn't it? And they meet here. So come and see Leslie. Um, Luke, Luke chapter 4. We've been talking about the um, uh, Holy Spirit. We've been talking about different things that we shouldn't do with the Holy Spirit, uh, grieving, resisting, uh, that sort of stuff. And then we've moved on a few weeks ago to three things that the Word of God tells us we should be doing in relation to the Holy Spirit. That is one, we should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Second one is we should be led by the Holy Spirit. And the third thing is we should be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to sort of continue down that path a little bit here. I want to start to look a little bit at the uh, question or the issue or the idea of being led by the Holy Spirit. So we'll see uh, how long we sort of go on with this. But in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, and then verse 14, this is where we get these three things from. Luke 4, 1, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit, This is just after his baptism, and it's very clear there that that the Spirit of God comes upon Jesus. Jesus is filled with the Spirit. And then we go forward to verse 14. And in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Hang on. Sorry, verse 4. He was filled with the Spirit, then he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then after being led by the Spirit into the wilderness, we all know what happened there. It's the temptation narrative where he's tempted by the enemy. And then after that temptation narrative, he comes out and it says he returned in the power of the Spirit. So we see this this, uh, sequence of events where he's filled with the Spirit. And we've talked about that. And then Jesus is led by the Spirit. And as a result of being led by the Spirit, it says that he came out in the power of the Spirit. And so we want to talk about that today and just go down that path a little bit. Jesus is filled. And then the first thing that Luke tells us that took place once he's filled was that Jesus was then led by the Spirit. We're filled by the Holy Spirit, and it's not just a one-off goosebump. It's not just a, a, a feeling. It's, it, the Spirit has a purpose in our lives. Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit as a person, but he also spoke of the Holy Spirit as, as having a purpose, a reason, as to why Jesus said to his disciples, don't go and preach, don't go and do anything until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to live out the Christian life. In fact, you try to live the Christian life in your own strength, you will fail miserably because the two concepts of living the Christian life by yourself are untenable. They don't go together. They're impossible. Nobody can be the person God wants them to be separate from the ability and the capacity of the Holy Spirit to help us become that person. And no one's going to do all the things that God wants us to do in our own strength. Uh, uh, You go back to, to the story of Gideon. And everyone, remember that story, Judges 6, I think it is, the story of Gideon? And, and it just seems to be the complete opposite to the way that we would think. But we are told by Isaiah, I think it is, that God's thoughts are what? They're, they're not our thoughts. And his ways are, they're not our ways. So, so God's thoughts are not ours, and his ways are not ours. But then he goes on, he says, for God's thoughts are higher than ours. He doesn't say God's thoughts are different to yours, and his ways are different. He says, no, 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 God's thoughts and ways are higher than yours. They're not just different. Sometimes we just think they're different. And so because it's different, well, it's, it's you know, six to one, half a dozen of another. You know, God, they're just different. They're not different. God's ways are higher and God's thoughts are higher. They're higher. And so in the story of Gideon, we see this situation where Gideon has a, a, an army of men and he's, God comes and says, you're going to lead them into battle and we're going to uh, free Israel. But then God looks down and says to Gideon, but the problem is you've got too many men. And you'll go out with that amount of men, and I guarantee you, Gideon, you'll have victory. But the problem is, it's not just about the victory, it's about who gets the glory. He says, you'll, get, you'll have victory, but Israel will claim glory for themselves. And he says, I'm not having that. I don't, that that's not what this Christian life is about. It's not about trying to become great so that I can get glory, uh, because I can do some wonderful things. Who, who, who can do some wonderful things? I, I can do some great things. I'm really good at some things, and, and, and I have a natural capacity to, to, to do some things pretty well. And if you do some things long enough, you get quite good. You learn how to do them better, and, and you can actually get to the point where you don't even bring God into that anymore because you just fly on, on your own ability, your own skill set, and your own intellect. And you leave God out there, and we see it all the time. 
But God doesn't want that. He wants to be involved in that process. He wants to be a part of what we do and so on because God, at the end of the day, wants glory. It says here that when Jesus was filled, it says that he was then led by the Spirit. The first thing that that Jesus had to learn when the Holy Spirit came upon him and filled him, the next thing that God said on the agenda is, now I've filled you with the Spirit. Now I want you to learn how to be led by the Spirit. And before you think I'm being blasphemous by saying Jesus had to learn, we'll get there in a second. But learning to be led preceded walking in the power of the Spirit. Why? Because God wants us to listen to him and to do what he says so that he can release whatever it is that he wants to release into a given situation a given community, whatever, so that he gets the glory. We do it, you know that uh, old song, I did it my way, you know? God's going, no, no, I want you to do it Yahweh's way, you know? God wants us to do it his way, and then he gets the glory, and he releases what he wants to do. Who doesn't want to see more of the power of God flowing through them in this room? I want to see more of the power of God. I, I don't feel like, see, my shadow is not healing the sick yet. I read about a guy called Peter, and, and his shadow healed the sick. Anyone ever read that? Yep. And, and, and handkerchiefs and things when they pray. Like, I'm not seeing all of that right now. Now, I'm okay with that if I can find a use-by date to the power of God, but I can't. Because I can't find a use-by date anywhere here, nobody in here said, that's all over. That season's finished now. It's all gone. No one said that. I can't find it in here. But I know this, that that I'm not seeing a lot of that happen in my world at the moment. And so there's a disconnect somewhere between the reality of God's power and what I know God is capable of and what I know he can do and what I'm actually seeing and experiencing in my life. And when I look at this sequence, I go, they were filled with the Spirit. The end game was empowered by the Spirit. But the link between the two was learning to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we need to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. I was at the hospital uh, with my daughter this week. I spent half the week at the hospital. Um, felt like it anyway. She, she was, uh, got some pains and wasn't doing well and they're running tests and things. And I'm sitting in the emergency ward waiting to go in. And I think we sat there for like over three hours. And all these people are coming in with, with problems and, and, and you know, their bodies are not in good spaces and, and, they, and they're all sitting in this waiting room together and people are getting a little agitated because, you know, but the ladies at the hospital were brilliant. You know, we've got no beds. I'm sorry, we're working on it. Da, da, da. But I'm sitting there looking around at all these people going, you know what, God, I would just love to, to, to be able to stand up and walk up to them and go to the lady at the counter... Don't worry, love, I've got this. Everybody, gather around. Put your hands out. I'm going to come along and gazoong, 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 and you're all going to be healed and you can go home and get on with the rest of your night. And, and, and I'm sitting there, I'm going, God, this is, this is my heart's cry and my heart's desire. That, God, we would see more of the power of God released through God's people. More of the healing power of God. More of the delivering power of God. More, more of, you know what it says when Jesus preached, when he spoke about the kingdom? When Jesus spoke to people, it says there was an authority. There was something on his words. Something came out. It wasn't just the words coming out. There was something on the words that caused conviction and change and transformation in people's lives. Yet how many of us in this room know we talk to people about God, we quote the word of God, but we kind of feel like it just walks off the edge of the cliff and dies. And we look around and go, why is it not? Why is there no transformation? Why is there no change? Why are we not? And I I go back and I go filled and empowered, but there's this link in the middle of learning how to be actually led by the Holy Spirit. So at the end of the day, God gets the glory when he starts pouring all this stuff through us. And and we are a bunch of people, I hope and I believe, that want to see God glorified. I, I, I can't turn anyone's mourning into dancing, okay? I can't. I can't even dance myself. But I don't have the capacity to do that, but I know a God who does. You're the only one who can. I can't turn someone's beauty into ashes. Not in my own self, I can't. I can pump their tires up for a day or two, but then they're going to come crashing back down to the reality of where their world's really at. I can't do that, but God can, and he's the only one who can. Amen? And so I want to be used by God, and I want to see God use me, and I want to see God use everybody in this church in ways where we bring healing, 
in ways where we bring deliverance, in ways where we can, we can, God can use us to bring conviction. God can use us to, to lift people up. God can use us to do the things that he wants to do in the community around us. Because in case you haven't noticed, when, when, if, if, if the church continues on without power, it's going nowhere. I don't know if, 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 if you've noticed that. Anyone disconnect the power in their house? I, had, we, well, I got solar put up this week. Um, thank you, Mr. Luca, ben, ben Luca Electrical. Um, came in and we got solar panels on our roof. And I had um, my computer sitting there doing some work and, and stuff like that. And at one point, um, uh, Ben's offsider came in and uh, said, I've just got to turn your power off for a bit. And he turned the power off and guess what? It was dead in my house for a while. It was dead in the house. There was nothing there. There was no light that was shining. There was no noises being made by the fridge. Nothing was cooling down. Nothing was able to be heated up. It was just dead. And then when he'd done his little bit, he flicked the switch on. And all of a sudden, ping, on came a light. And the fridge went, and noise and life and energy came back into that place because the power was switched back on. And I wonder, in how many places of worship this morning is the power turned off? Because we're just trying to do things in our own strength. Because we've lost a hunger for the reality of the fact that if God genuinely is God, and this stuff genuinely is true, then I believe there's more. We've got a sign out there on that wall. It says, Arise, born for more. And I, I think we need to get hungry and want to go after the more. Amen? We, 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 you know, this street was a dead-end street a week ago. A week ago, you drove in and you just stopped. There was like a dead-end street. I'm not saying this place was dead-end. I'm saying that street was a dead-end street. You couldn't go any further than about 100 metres down that road. There was a blockage. It was stopped. And along came council and did all that they did, and they ripped that open. And now you can go further than you've ever been able to go down this street. You can drive harder and faster. And I know some of you drive too fast. I'm not encouraging that. But I'm just saying that the the blockage has been removed, and there's way, way more more places you can go down this road now. And I think that's what God wants for us. He wants us to, 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 to get them blockages moved out of the way so that we can go as far as God wants us to go, as fast as God wants us to go, get to the place he wants us to get to. But we need to be learn. We need to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because we can run out there and go, I'm going to heal everybody. Here's the deal. I could have called everybody up and laid hands on everybody. On, and I've got a pretty good idea of what I think may have happened. And if you don't believe that, then how uncompassionate are you? Get up out of your chair now. Go to the hospital now and pray for everybody, you selfish person. If you can just turn it on, go and do it. Go and help people now. Get out of here. Get out of here. But we know deep down inside that there is this desire for all the stuff, but we also know the reality that there's this disconnect. And I believe that one of the keys to connecting those two things is to learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 5, verse 19 to 20, Jesus said this. As Jesus gave them this answer, he said, Very truly I say to you. Now this is Jesus we're talking about, the Son of God. This is Jesus. He says, The Son can do what? Nothing by himself. Hang on, hang on a second. This is Jesus. This is the sinless Son of God standing there. I mean, if I was Jesus, I would have said, I can do whatever I want, baby. But he's there going, I actually can't do anything in my own self. He can only do what he what? sees the Father doing. What does that mean? It means that I'm seeing something that's leading me. I'm being led by the Father. I'm seeing what the Father's doing. And, and that's the path I'm going down. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. I copy my father. Anyone, anyone ever grow up watching their dad tinker on a car? Or, or uh, any, anyone ever see their dad uh, mowing a lawn? And so you got a little toy lawnmower and you pushed it around. You just copied your dad. Anyone ever, ever, ever do things like that? When they were, or you're, you're in the kitchen and you're watching mum and maybe she's making a cake or something. So you got out your bowl and you start... Fresh, and, and it's just chaos and madness and things going. But it doesn't matter because you're doing what you saw your mother do. You're doing what you see your father do. You're taking your cues. You're being led by them. It's not just your own impulse, your own desire. You're going, that's what they're doing. I'm going to do that too. I'm going to do that too. So the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Jesus said, I'm only doing, whatever you, whatever you read in these, this collection of ancient documents, when you read something, Jesus did this, you can know this. Didn't start with Jesus. He was led to do it. 
He was led to do it. He saw the Father doing it. He said, right, that's what the Father's doing. I'm going to go and do it. Why did Jesus at the pool of Bethesda heal one person? I mean, why didn't he heal everybody? That, that place was known as a place, it was like an ancient spiritual hospital where the sick were dumped. And, and, and the story is when an angel came and stirred up the waters, the first person in the water was totally healed. Jesus walks by and he sees one man there. And he says to the guy, do you want to be healed? And of course the guy, oh, well, how can I? I mean, I've got a limp and I can't even get down to the water. And when I start to go, everyone beats me, they're quicker than me, and here I am again, waiting. And Jesus heals him. Why did he not heal everybody there? Oh, my assumption is he didn't see the Father doing that. He didn't see the Father doing that. John 12, verse 49 to 50. Jesus again, for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I've spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. What's he saying? Hey, you, you hear the stuff I'm saying? I'm being led to say it. I've learnt to follow my father, I'm being led to say these things. I'm not saying them on impulse. I'm not just saying them uh, for the sake of it. I'm not saying them because it's my desire to say this. And do. No, no, it's not about that. I'm, I'm, I'm being led by a higher power. I'm being led by my father. And because I'm being led by my father and I'm following in my father's footsteps, I'll guarantee you this, there's going to be power attached to that. There's going to be results attached to that. There's going to be fruit attached to that. Because I'm just doing what the father is telling me to do. And the Father's not wasting his words, he's not wasting his actions, he's not wasting his power. Jesus was not led by impulse or by his own feelings or his own desires or by his own intellect. He was led by God. He learnt to be led by God. Now when we think of being led by the Spirit, we tend to think in terms of, you know, Jesus, tell me to preach. Tell me to go and pray for this sick person, heal them. Give me a word for this person. Uh, Tell me to do what Jesus did. And God can do that. He can definitely do that. I remember sitting in a, 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 I did a school of evangelism in Youth of the Mission way back in the early 90s. And um, I remember sitting in a lecture. We, we only had one lecture room on the YWAM base at the time. And so uh, the, the discipleship training school was in there. We had to pitch a big, like a circus tent out in the middle of a muddy paddock. And we had our lectures there because there was only one room. And so we got shafted into a tent. I remember sitting there one day and a guy called BJ, Bernard James, and we're sitting there and in the middle of lectures there's a guy preaching. Bernard James is sitting in the front row there. He jumps up and ran out the tent and everybody's like, what is going on? He just jumped up and ran. But, you know, he was a bit of a wild character, BJ, so we only thought about it for a second and then we went back to the speaker. BJ disappears for about 20 minutes and he comes back in, sits down as if nothing had happened. You know, he disrupted everyone's attention, you're back and you sit again. Get on with life. At the end of the, uh, the, that lecture that morning, we asked BJ, what happened? He said, well, I was just sitting there during lectures. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, get up right now. And the, the YWAM base was at a place called Carbrook on the south side of Brisbane. It was a, basically farmland back in those days. He, got, he said, the Holy Spirit told me to get up right now. I had to get up right now, run out, leave the YWAM base, run to the main road, Redland Bay Road, cross the road and go and stand in the middle of this vacant paddock. And BJ's the kind of guy that would not question that. He said, okay, yes, sir, whatever. Me, I'd probably go, really? Is that really you got? Send the dove to fly above me as a confirmation. Now make the person next to me scratch their right cheek and, you know, I'd come up. But BJ's went, okay, no worries, I'm going to do it. And he runs out there and he says, I got out there, I'm standing in the middle of the place. And he said, this car pulls up. And then these two guys get out of the car and they're covered in tats and that. They jump over the fence and they walk out to the paddock and they're coming out there to collect magic mushrooms, collect gold tops. And he's standing there, and as they walk towards him, he said, the Holy Spirit said to me, to this guy, your name's Kevin, you're an Australian kickboxing or karate champion or something, and Jesus loves you. And so this guy's walking towards him, and BJ, here's this guy standing in the middle of a paddock, and he looks up at this guy walking towards him, covered in tat stuff, and he goes, hi, your name's Kevin, and you're an Australian kickboxing champion, and Jesus told me to tell you that he loves you. Well, he turned around, bolted, jumped the fence, got in the car, and they took off. And BJ just calmly walked back into the tent and sat down. Now, who doesn't want that kind of stuff in their life? I do. I want to see God use me like that. But before God can lead you into what he wants you to do, here's the thing. He has to lead you into who he wants you to be. He has to lead you into who he wants you to be. One of the downfalls of modern Pentecostalism is that sometimes we portray the image that God doesn't care who you are. So long as you're doing the stuff. As long as you're preaching good. As long as you're you're seeing people healed, as long as people are being delivered, so long as as the church is growing, you know, so long as your ministry is pumping along, so long as, so long as, so long as, and it doesn't really matter. And we all know that that's just not true, amen? 
And we've seen the results of that time and time and time again. People that thought it was just all about doing the power of God, being led by God to do, 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 never really allowing God to lead them into who they were meant to be. And one day you you build this massive big empire and one day who you really are comes out and that whole thing collapses and people get hurt. Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 5, sorry, verse 8 to 9, speaking about Jesus, said this. It says, Son though he was... Think about this. He, what? He learned obedience. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about, little, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, little baby, growing up, the guy that healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, preached the God. You ever, you ever thought about the fact that Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God, had to learn obedience? He had to learn obedience. Jesus had to learn. We, we sometimes have this innate uh, image of Jesus that everything was just simple and easy and perfect for him. And that he just, and, and it makes it hard, doesn't it? Because we hear we should be conformed into the image of a man that was never conformed into that image. He just was. No, he just wasn't. He was conformed as well into what the Father wanted him to be. And God was at work in his life. It says, son though he was, he learned obedience. Learning obedience is another way of saying learning to be led by the Spirit. Because when we're being obedient, what are we doing? We are being led by the Spirit. That's what obedience is. It's, it's, it's being led, taking our cues, our, 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 our direction from the Holy Spirit. That's what we call obedience. When we're being obedient to God, the truth is, behind the scenes, we're being led by the Holy Spirit. The devil's not leading you to obedience. Your natural flesh doesn't want to go down the obedience path. They're pulling against. They're at enmity with God. They're fighting against. So when we move in obedience, we're actually being led by the Holy Spirit. It says that though he was a son, he learned obedience. Get this, from what he suffered. What he suffered. So obeying doesn't always feel good, does it? Obedience to God doesn't always feel good. And when God comes and gets in amongst the nitty-gritty of our life and starts putting his finger on some things and goes, eh, that attitude, let's talk about it. Eh, that thing that you keep going back to, let's talk about it. It doesn't feel good all the time. When that, that natural thing to run this way, one day God says, I don't want you running that way anymore. I, I, you've got to turn from that. It doesn't feel good. There's a sense of suffering in that. Most of us kind of feel like, uh, have this image of of God stopping us from doing this that we naturally enjoy or like, whether it's good for us or not is irrelevant, but we just naturally flow into it and we like it and we enjoy it and it feels good. And when God says stop, it's almost like this image of God killing our fun. What we now realize is that that when God says don't do that and go this way, the end result is we, we never lose out when we follow God. We never lose out when we obey God. He never shortchanges us. We never get ripped off. We always come out with an absolute bargain. We come out with something that's worth way more than what we went in there with. That's the truth about God. And many of us in this room have that testimony in certain areas of our lives, but there are still other areas of our lives where we yet to have that testimony because we're still not quite sure that we want to go across and be that person. He learned from the things that he suffered. And then it says, and once made perfect... Once made perfect. Hang on a second. We've got this image of Jesus just being perfect from day dot. That little baby, they brought frankincense and myrrh and so on. That little baby, he never cried. Never cried. Jesus never cried. Never pooed his nappy. Never did. Never did. Made his own bottles. Actually just crawled across to the goats in the stable and fed himself. Jesus was perfect. Absolutely perfect. Apparently not. Because apparently he was being perfected. He was made perfect. And somehow that perfection came through him choosing obedience and suffering along the process, but coming out the other end and and being perfected. There's a process of change and transformation that takes place in our life. And even Jesus had to go through the process of resisting temptation and submitting to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus had to do that. And it goes on, it says, Because of that, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Hebrews 4.15 It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. Jesus was actually tempted. But the thing is that that he grew and he transformed and he became perfect and he learned to be led by the Spirit. And the end game there was that he was perfect, but he didn't sin. Different to you and to me. Jesus went through the process of becoming before he was released into doing. See? See, the place God leads us into being is in the garden of temptation. What happens? Jesus is filled with the Spirit. And then he's led by the Spirit. What's the first place the Spirit leads him to? It's not to heal the sick. It's not to raise the dead. He doesn't lead him to a synagogue and say, go and preach a great message. He leads him into a place where he's tested and tempted. First place Jesus gets taken to is to a place of temptation. 
And we need to learn to be led by the Spirit out of temptation before we're ready to be led by the Spirit into power. However, how many of you want to be led into the power of God? You, just want, you, would love to, you would love to walk out of here this morning, go and buy your fish and chips for lunch and have the Spirit of God say to you, that guy behind the counter, he's two days off going bankrupt. If he would just do this and do that and God would change his life. Who wouldn't? I want that. I'm hoping it happens. I'm not having fish and chips after this, but whatever I'm eating, I'm hoping that happens. I would love to go down back to that hospital and to see all those people and just have God say to me, right, now's the time. Go up and pray for them. I'm going to release healing power. And once they're healed, I want you to tell them this is why you've been healed. This is a sign. It's a sign. Signs point you to something, and this sign is pointing you to the love of God and the sacrifice of Jesus for your sins. Yes. That's what it's all about. I want that. I would, I, I would love for that to happen. But before God can ever lead me into the power of God, I've got to learn to be led by him out of those places of temptation in my life. I've got to learn to be, follow the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. Do you look for God in the midst of personal temptation? Do you look for God in the midst of temptation? All temptations are common to man. We've all been tempted. There's stuff that goes on. And temptation has a lot to do, not so much with what's going on out there, but James talks about we're tempted when we're pulled away by our own desires, Right? So James is saying the hook for temptation is what's in you. It's not what's out there. Stop. Don't blame pornography. I'm against it. I'm not for it. But I'm saying that's, that's the thing. But what's the hook in you that drags you to it? Don't blame the alcohol and the drugs. I'm not into them all. I'm, I'm, I'm not, but hear what I'm saying. All that stuff out there are the leaves on the tree, but there's a root system that's hooked into you. What's the root stuff going on in your life that makes that so appealing and drags you back to that all the time? Even though deep down inside as a follower of Jesus, you don't want to go there. But you keep going back, and you keep going back, and you keep going back. In those moments, in those moments, do you look for the leading of the Spirit to get you out of those things? Or not? Do you look for God in the midst of personal temptation? If you're not, then you're probably not the kind of person God will look for when he wants to display his personal power. That's the reality. If we're not the kind of person that will, that, that will look for God and allow God to lead us out of temptation, we're probably not going to be the kind of people that God will choose to lead into his power. Paul put it this way when he's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 to 21. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. He said, In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. So homes back in those days, they had vessels of, of wood and porcelain like clay, but then they had their silver and their gold and their brass ones and so on. And they were used for different things. If a dignitary came around or someone special, you, you know, you've all got it at home. How many of you have got those plates in the cupboard that you save for a special occasion? Anyone got them? And you probably never used them, have you? They're just sitting there collecting dust. You know, you've got the, the wine glasses that yeah, maybe you have a wine with your dinner and then you've got the special wine glasses waiting for a special occasion and you've never ever touched them in your whole life because you're still waiting for a special occasion. Well, it's that kind of thing. The gold and the silver is that stuff sitting there waiting for a really noble purpose to be used. And the rest of the stuff, we just use that any day, is it? You know, there's a distinction between how you can use those two things and how you choose to use those two things. He says, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some, some are for special purposes and some are for common use. Now, catch this. He's not speaking about crockery, people. He's speaking about people in the house of God, right? You're the porcelain or the wood or the silver or the gold or the bronze, he says, those who cleanse themselves from the latter. Now, if you continue on in this passage, he's going to talk about some things. And he's saying this, if you cleanse yourself from those things, if you, if you distance yourself from those things, and if they're attractive to you and you're tempted by them, find out why, work out what the hook is and so on. If you can move yourself from those things, cleanse yourself from the latter, he said, you will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Notice this, God did not make any vessel more honorable than any other. And God doesn't determine the usage of the vessel. You do. You do. He says, hey, there's, there's vessels for honourable use and there's vessels for common use. And every house has them and every church has them and the kingdom has them too. But he says, if you'll cleanse yourself from the letter, which type of vessel you are, I'll leave it up to you. Cleanse yourself from that stuff and you can become the vessel that when the dignitaries come, I go, I'm not using that cup, I'm going to that special cupboard with that special cup and he pulls you out and goes, I've got a noble purpose for you. I've got a special purpose for you. I want you to, to, to use you in, in this way. But he says, it's not up to me. I'm not the one. He says, I love you all equally and I give you all equal opportunity. The kingdom is an equal opportunity kingdom. 
Okay? He says, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the option. You, you can be a... I, will love, I love those things that I have for common use, but I've got some special purposes too. And I'm looking for those people who will cleanse themselves of this stuff, people that would set themselves apart for my purposes and for my plans. Now, here's the good news. If you're a believer in this place, then you have been set up to become a vessel for special purposes. That opportunity is there for every single person in this room. At least that's what Paul believed when he, said, when he wrote that to Timothy. He said, the choice is yours, basically. If you're prepared to do the work and cleanse yourself of this stuff, and if you, if you want to do that, then you're going to set yourself apart for special purposes, more so than just common purposes. And, and, and all purposes are necessary, but again, he says there is a distinction, and it comes back to what do we want to do? What, do, what are we prepared to do? How consecrated, how set apart, how sanctified do we want to be for God's purposes and plans? Or do we love, I don't know, maybe we... Maybe, some, maybe we love this world too much, that we don't want to separate ourselves too much from it. I'm not saying come out of it and, and, and not have anything to do with the world. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. We're just not. Hey, I might get the um, band. You guys want to come back? Finish up. So why should we be looking out for God in the midst of our temptations? The simple answer is this, because God's looking out for you. God's looking out for you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Why should we be looking out for God in the midst of temptations? Well, here's what God does for you in the midst of temptation. He makes sure your temptations are not unique. You're not the only person facing whatever you're facing. You're not the only person with the hurt and disappointment that you know is holding you back. You're not the only person. So many people think, I can't talk to anyone because I've never, because nobody would understand. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Because there's nothing you've gone through that's uncommon to mankind. There are lots of people out there. I think there's something really key and strategic in the book of James. James says this. He says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He doesn't say confess your sins to God. God dealt with your sins 2,000 years ago. He's forgiven you. No matter what you've done, God has forgiven you. Right? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Accept the forgiveness of God. He's not killing, he's not re-sacrificing himself every time you sin and come and say sorry and he goes, oh, I've got to hang on the cross again. He did it once for all, Hebrews tells us. That the, the sacrifice, the power of that sacrifice once for eternity, it's been done. But James says, don't worry about going back and confessing to God. God's forgiven you. Confess to somebody else. Go and talk to people about it. Because that's when healing can come, when you start bringing these things out into the light and talking about some of those hooks that are in your life and so on. Because some of that stuff is stopping you being the person you were created to be. You're not being the person that God wants you to be. And before we can be led into the power of God, we've got to learn in the midst of temptation to allow God to lead us out of temptation. It's the first thing that happened to Jesus. And it's the first thing that's going to happen to us if we're serious about moving in the power of God. He makes sure that your temptations are not unique. Second thing that verse tells us is he makes sure there's a cap on temptation's power in your life. You notice that? God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? God has faith in you. Whatever the temptation is, whatever the hook is, whatever's coming, it's almost like temptation wants to kill you and destroy you and God stands there and goes, that's enough. That's the cap. I'm not going to let you go any harder because I know that you won't be able to bear it. So I'm going to hold back the full force and the full brutality of whatever that temptation is that's trying to distort you and stop you from being who you're meant to be. God says, I'm, going to, I'm right there with you. Uh, I'm not only am I making sure that there's no unique new thing coming to you that nobody's ever experienced, I'm also going to stand there and hold back the power of that. I'm going to cap it at a point. I'm only going to let it go to a point where I know you can beat it. You know, amazing, the amount of faith that God must have in us. I think about the amount of times temptation comes in my world and I fail. And then I read this verse and I go, God, what didn't I see in me? What didn't I see in me that you did see in me? Because you thought I could say no to that. You, you thought I could beat it. You've told me that. Whatever just came, whatever I, I bowed to, whatever I gave into, you've told me that I can bear it. Because you've made a promise that you won't let it go beyond what I can't. I know so many people that have got issues and things in their life and they just throw their hands in the air and go, well, I've just got to live with this uh, uh, broken, uh, uh, distorted view of who I am and, and I'll never really become fully what God wants and I can't because, and, and I'm looking there going, no, God, God has a way out of this stuff for us. God has a way out of this for you this morning. 
He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And the third thing that he says here is that he'll also provide a way out of it, a way of escape when temptation comes to you. Now, here's the thing. When temptation comes, when you're in the midst of temptation, are you looking for God's leading to get you out of it? That's what he's saying. In the midst of the temptation, I'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. In other words, right there where temptation is pulling you this way, the Holy Spirit is there going, I've got a door, an exit plan for you. I can get you out of this. And we've got to learn in the midst of those moments of temptation, we've got to learn how do you, be, how do you allow yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit in that moment of temptation? And if we can learn how to be led by the Spirit in the midst of the temptation, you know what happens? We change and we transform. The Holy Spirit might say, go and talk to a counsellor about that hook. The Spirit might say, make yourself more accountable. Go and get some people to pray for you. The Spirit might say, you need to forgive. The Spirit might say, you need to give. The Spirit, oh, I'm not the Holy Spirit and I don't have all the answers. Remember, His thoughts are what? Higher than mine. And His ways are higher. I don't have the answers. I just know that there's a problem. God has solutions. He won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And when we are tempted, He provides a way out for us. See, God's doing everything He can to make us into vessels of honour, to help lead us back to who we were created to be so we can do what we were created to do. The question is, are you cooperating with Him? Are you cooperating with Him? If you won't allow God to lead you into being, you will never be able to be led into doing It's the being that comes first. Because how you allow God to lead you in temptation is a reflection of how you'll follow God outside of it. If in temptation you dig your heels in and just go your own way and ignore Him and just do what you feel is right, outside of it you'll do the same thing. You'll just keep doing what you think is right. You'll go down to the pool of Bethesda and try to heal 50 people. And God's saying, there's only one. You'll try to raise a dead person on God. I'll say, no, 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 I'm going to get more glory out of this person's death than I will out of a resurrection. Because his ways are higher and his thoughts are higher. So I want to be led by the one whose thoughts are higher. And I want to learn to be led by the one whose ways are higher because they're higher. Not different. They're higher. I want to just open up the front this morning. I want to pray for some people this morning in this place. If you're struggling to see God's way of escape, you're caught in something and you know it's repetitive, you know it's, it's going on and, and you're struggling to see the way of escape, the promise from God is there's a way of escape, then we want to pray with you this morning. I want to pray that God would open up your eyes, unblock your ears so that you can see in that moment, in the midst of that, when the battle is very real in your life, that you would be able to see this is God's way of escape. The promise for me in this moment is a way of escape. And God, I want to see that way of escape. I want to pray for those people this morning. And the other group of people we want to pray for is those who are desiring. You're desiring to be that vessel for special purposes. You know, you know that that there's more. You know that God has more for you. You know that you walk the streets of this community. You know that God wants to do more outside the walls of this church. You know He does. You know that God, you know that God heals today, but you're not seeing it. You know God can deliver people, but you're not seeing it. You you know that, 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 that there are great and wonderful things that God wants to do. You know that God wants to shine a much more brighter light in our world today and in our community today than what's happening right now. You, you know that and you desire to be that person that, that he can begin to use and say, you're not, you're not just for common purposes. I'm going to use you for special purposes. Because I think God's got some amazing special purposes that he wants to do in our generation, in our community. I could have been born in 18th century China. I wasn't. I was born in Australia in 1972, and I'm here in Ganella Bar in 2023. Why? I don't have to know. He does, and I want to get in line with him. And now why is it that we are here, God? Why is it that at this time and this season, you allowed us to come into this world? Why is it that we have been shaped and molded, had the experiences, the trials? There is a purpose to it all. And if you're that person and, and you, you, you're, you, you just feel that stirring of the Holy Spirit in your heart that I, I want to step more into that side of my Christianity as well, we want to pray for you this morning as well. So I'm going to pray right now. We're going to finish up. Hey, there's tea and coffee next door. Feel free. There's actually some wonderful morning tea there too, by the way. And if you beat me to it, please save me at least one Tim Tim. Okay. 
So I'm going to pray. Feel free to go. But these guys are going to lead us in worship. You want to stay in worship, you can. You want to stay in your chair and just sit with God, you can do it. But I'm going to invite people, if you want to be prayed for, come on up. We would love to pray with you this morning. And just let's just invite the Holy Spirit in. Let's just see what the Holy Spirit might want to do this morning. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place this morning. God, we thank you for the Word of God. Lord, we thank you, God, that you, uh, Father, you put that opportunity uh, uh, to us. God, you extend an opportunity to us that, God, we, 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 we can be that vessel for special purposes. We can be that. God, but we, I know that we've got to be that person that you want us to be before we can do those things you want us to do. And so, Lord, for each person in this room this morning, God, I just pray, Holy Spirit, speak, move, do, open eyes, open ears, challenge. God, call us up. God, call us to more consecration. Call us to more, uh, God, just being set apart, God. God, I, I pray that the, the lures and the attraction of the things of the world, the get, the, the faster, the bigger, the, the image, all that stuff, Lord, that, that God, one day we'll all just burn and be nothing. But our relationship with you will go on. And the way that we bring the presence of God to earth, the ripple effect and the impact of that will go on. So, Father, just do a work, I pray, in our hearts in this place this morning. And, Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.